Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulullah. Prophet, part of true faith in all known religions is belief in the reality of prophets and messengers sent by God. For no claim religion is void of such a reality and belief. However, what does differ and differ quite substantially in many cases is how these prophets and messengers are viewed and defined. Amongst what is termed the three Abrahamic faiths, on the surface it seems to be more congruous in this regard. But again, under close examination we will discover stark differences as well as grave inconsistencies within the sources themselves. Thus we present the following. When looking at the prophets and messengers, let us have an understanding of what it means to be such and how we relate to them. For the vagueness exists within many scriptures of actually what is a prophet and what are their roles and responsibilities and what is the relationship of the people to these prophets and messengers that were sent by God. Let us look at five points that we want to cover as we explore this idea of prophets and messengers and then at the end, we want to make the contrast between how the Islamic picture presents prophets and messengers and how the Christian picture presents prophets and messengers. And we leave it to you, the audience, to decide whether the Islamic picture is more consistent with what are the aims and purposes as we understand them of God to send prophets and messengers to humanity or is the Bible picture of prophets and messengers one consistent with the divine message from the Lord of the worlds to guide humanity back to his path? The first question we want to ask is what and who are prophets and messengers? What and who are prophets and messengers? And we find stated in the Quran the following. In chapter 6, verses 83 to 90, it says the following. وَتِلْكَ حُجَّتُنَا آتَيْنَا إِبْرَاهِيمَ عَلَى قَوْمِهِ نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ نَشَاءٍ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ حَكِيمٌ عَلِيمٌ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ وَزَكَرِيَّا وَيَحْيَى وَعِيسَى وَإِلْيَاسِ كُلٌّ مِّنَ الصَّالِحِينَ وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ وَالْيَسَعَ وَيُونُسَ وَلُوطًا وَكُلًّا فَضَّلْنَا عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ وَمِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَّاتِهِمْ وَإِخْوَانِهِمْ وَاجْتَبَيْنَاهُمْ وَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ ذَلِكَ هُدَى اللَّهِ يَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَلَوْ أَشْرَكُوا لَحَبِطَ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةَ 
in chapter 33 verse 40 it says the following so we can see quite clearly from these descriptions, prophets and messengers are people who God has elected and raised up and he has gave us various names of them as well as names of of other prophets and messengers that we don't know but nonetheless God has sent many prophets and many messengers to the nations throughout the history of humanity concluding with the final prophet and final messenger Muhammad Ibn Abdullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the next question we want to ask is what are their respective roles what are the roles of prophets and messengers as we find mentioned in the scripture does God define for us exactly what their roles are and what they should be doing in the Quran in chapter 6 verses 48 to 49 it says <laughs> فَمَنْ آمَنَ وَأَصْلَحَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ وَالَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَمَسُّهُمُ الْعَذَابُ بِمَا كَانُوا يَفْسُقُونَ In another place in the Quran, in chapter 21, verse 25, it states, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ Also in the Quran, in another place, in the 42nd chapter of the Quran, verse 13, it states, شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينِ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحًا وَالَّذِي أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَمَا وَصَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَمُوسَى وَعِيسَى أَنْ أَقِيمُوا الدِّينَ وَلَا تَتَفَرَّقُوا فِيهِ كَبُرَ عَلَى الْمُشْرِكِينَ مَا تَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ اللَّهُ يَجْتَبِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَيَهْدِي إِلَيْهِ مَنْ يُنِيبَ And in another place in the Quran, it says in its 16th chapter of the Quran, verse 36, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِ اعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُوا الطَّاغُوتِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ هَدَى اللَّهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ حَقَّتْ عَلَيْهِ الضَّلَالَةِ فَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ So we see here in these verses, the role of the messengers, the role of the prophets, is to bring the guidance of God to the people, and to teach them about the oneness of God, and to call them away from evil, and indecency, and wickedness, and corruption, and oppression, and tyranny, 
and wrongdoing and cheating and lying and thievery and stealing and murder and, 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 and these activities. This is the role of the messengers and the prophets to humanity. Again, to establish the oneness of God, first and foremost, to have them believe properly, as well as for them to learn how to live amongst humanity in a civil and respectable way. And we also find in the Bible a description of the prophets mentioned in Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. It says, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so you should be established. Believe in his prophets, so you shall prosper. So in this verse we see that God, even in the Bible, has coined the belief in the prophets with belief in God. The oneness of God alone. And this will be considered clearly as the declaration of faith. To affirm the unity, the oneness of God Almighty, and to affirm the belief in all of his prophets and messengers whom he sent. The third question we want to ask is how are they to be seen and related to? How do we see and how do we relate to the previous prophets of the past? Again, we visit in the Quran chapter 6 verses 48 to 49 in which it states وَمَا نُرْسِلُ الْمُرْسَلِينَ إِلَّا مُبَشِّرِينَ وَمُنْذِرِينَ فَمَنْ آمَنَ وَأَصْلَحَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ والذين كذبوا بآياتنا يمسهم العذاب بما كانوا يفسقون. So the prophets they should be seen as ones that bring good tidings, good news, but also ones that brings the warning of God for those who reject and deny to accept them and accept the commands of God Almighty on the earth. And how should we relate to them? Then we should believe in them. And we should confirm them. And we should support them. And we should aid them. And we should follow them. And we should do our best. And taking the example and living it before God. As mentioned in the Quran, in the seventh chapter of the Quran, verse 157, it states, الذين يتبعون الرسول النبي الأمي الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم الذي يجدونه مكتوبا عندهم في التوراة والإنجيل يأمرهم بالمعروف يأمرهم بالمعروف وينهاهم عن المنكر ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحل لهم الطيبات ويحرم عليهم الخبائث ويضع عنهم إصرهم والأغلال التي كانت عليهم فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِهِ وَعَزَّرُوهُ وَنَصَرُوهُ وَاتَّبَعُوا النُّورَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ مَعَهُ أُولَئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ So God tells us that the relationship that the human being should have to the prophets and in particular, the Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him in this verse, as he is the final prophet and messenger sent to humanity, is that they, we should believe in them, and we should honor them, and we should support them, and we should follow the light which was sent down with them. And it is those who will be successful if they do indeed that. And the opposite is true for those who don't believe in them, and those who don't honor them, and those who don't support them, and those who don't follow the guidance and the light 
which they came down with, then indeed it is those who will be the unsuccessful, the failures. This is our relationship and role to the prophets and messengers. And also, as we read again, we visit Second Chronicles 20, 20, in which it states, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa, and they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so you should be established, and believe his prophets, so you shall prosper. Very similar from what we read in the Quran, mandating prosperity and tying it into with belief in the prophets that God has sent. Number four, the fourth question we want to ask as it relates to prophets is how do we know or how can we tell that the prophets and messengers that come are true, truly from God as they claim they are. In this we want to look at what is called the acid test and see in fact if these prophets meet up to what we understand was given from God Almighty as it relates to prophets and messengers. In the Bible in Deuteronomy 18, 18, starting there and continuing forward up to verse 22 it states starting at 17 actually and the Lord said unto me they have well spoken that which they have spoken I will raise them up a prophet from amongst their brethren like unto you talking to Moses peace be upon him and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him and it shall come to pass that whoever will not hear or listen unto my words which he shall speak in my name I will require it of him. I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if that thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. But the prophet that has spoken it presumptuously, thou should not be afraid of him. So here's a test by which we know, in fact, whether a prophet is true or not, according to a prescription given to us in Deuteronomy. If a prophet speaks something in the name of God and it comes true, then we can assure that that prophet has spoken in the name of God. But if that prophet speaks in the name of God, supposedly and what he says does not come true then you know that that person has not spoken in the name of God or also if that person who's claiming to be a prophet speaks and calling one to others besides God then also know that that person is not of God when we look at the different prophets and messengers through our history we can identify them through this test and can confirm whether or not they actually fit to be true prophets of God or not here we don't have the time to go into that into detail. We want to just lay some parameters and hopefully in a following video, we can look at different prophets, particularly the prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, since he is a final prophet and there's so much bone and contention about his prophethood amongst many. We can look at him and prove from this test as well as others that indeed he meets the standards to be a true prophet. Also we find in the Quran in chapter two, verse 146, where God mentions about the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and showing how we also can tell whether a prophet is true of God because that prophet is spoken of before his actual arrival. It says in chapter 2 verse 146 so God mentions in this verse that indeed the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was known to those who possessed the previous scripture as they know their own sons. And as we mentioned in the follow up video, we will look at these evidences and show how it was clear to those who had the scripture that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him was the one that was discussed and prophesied in the scripture of old and he fulfilled the prophecies related to him. The fifth question we want to ask is are there any more prophets to come? Are there any more messengers to come? And if not, then how do we relate and benefit 
from the ones that, that were sent already. In the chapter, the 33rd chapter of the Quran, verse 40, this question is answered quite clearly, and it says, مَا كَانَ مُحَمَّدٌ أَبَا أَحَدٍ مِّن رِّجَالِكُمْ وَلَكِن رَّسُولَ اللَّهِ وَلَكِن رَّسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ عَلِيمًا So the Quran categorically and unequivocally makes it known that the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him is indeed the final prophet and messenger that will come and he's the seal and when something is sealed that means that's it, it's closed prophethood and messengership is closed for eternity up until we return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so there's no need to give any clarifications about prophets to come or descriptions or answer tests as relate to any prophet or messenger after the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him because that door of prophethood and messengership is closed. But what you find in the Bible as we read in chapter 18 of Deuteronomy and other chapters that we're going to read now, there was tests given from the Bible about prophets to come later. Why? Because the seal of the prophets had not arrived yet. And because of that, there needed to be a warning. There needed to be a warning and there needed to be a description of how you're able to tell the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. Again, and I want us to highlight this point, understand this point very clearly. If, in fact, prophethood and messengership was sealed with the advent of Jesus, peace be upon him, then there would have been, had, there would, there, there have been no need. If prophethood and messengership was sealed with the advent of Jesus, peace be upon him, there would have been no need to give a test of how you distinguish a true prophet from a false prophet. In the Quran, in the Hadith of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, we don't have such tests. Why? Because the verdict is clear that the Prophet Muhammad indeed is the seal of all prophets. So had this been stated in the Bible, then it would have excluded anyone to come after him, after Jesus peace be upon him, had he been the final prophet and messenger. But given the reality that he was not to be the final prophet and messenger, and that this fact is known by the mere principle that he gave a description of how we can tell a true prophet from a false prophet. If no prophet was to come after Jesus, peace be upon him, then there would be no need to give such proclamations about true prophets or false prophets. Rather, it would have just been stated that I am the seal of prophets, and I am the seal of messengers, and none to come after me, and that door would have been eternally shut. But since that wasn't the case, then this gives clear rise to the fact that the prophet and messenger was to come after prophet Jesus, and not only from his testimony, but also from testimonies of others in the Bible to show that the people were waiting for other prophets to come after Jesus, peace be upon him. So we find in Deuteronomy 13, 1-4, another test of how we are to discern who is true, and who was false. It says, If there arise amongst you a prophet or a dream of dreams and gives you a sign or a wonder and a sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he speaks unto you saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them. You should not hear or obey unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proves you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You should walk after the Lord your God and fear Him and keep His commandments and obey His voice and you should serve Him and cleave unto Him. So even though a person may claim to be a prophet and may produce what may look like miracles, if that person calls to any other besides God alone, then we can never accept that person as being a prophet of God. And when we look at history, we find, even within Christianity, the formulation of Christianity, that the people are being called to worship others besides God. But rather not from the tongue and the mouth of Jesus, but from those who came after Him, who have elevated Him and calling people to worship the Creator of Jesus, but those who came after Him and calling people to worship the created things as opposed to worshiping the Creator. So that's one proclamation we find in the Bible Deuteronomy. 
In the New Testament, we find, again, a test to make sure people don't get confused, the wrong prophets and false prophets from the true prophets and right prophets. In Mark 13, verse 22, it says, For false Christs and false prophets shall rise, and you shall shew signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the elect. So even those people who may be grounded in faith, they may even be confused and tricked by belief in false prophets. But again, we bring this point because this is the, uh, this is the advice of Jesus. If Jesus was to be the last prophet and messenger, then he would not have to make his proclamation. He could just say, I am the final prophet and messenger, and none is to come after me, and the deal is closed. But because he knew, and he also prophesies about another prophet to come, then we have to have this answer test so we know who is true from who is false. Also, we find in the book of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 15 to 16, again, on the tongue of Jesus, according to the Bible, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravering wolves. You should know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs or thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is honed down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. So again, Jesus gives us an answer test of who's true and who's false. And again, when we look at, in particular, and our following video, the truth of prophethood of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, then we, we, we will revisit this verse and prove the truthfulness of the claim of prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So these are the five questions that we wanted to address and we wanted to bring the attention to prophets. And now in closing, we want to take a look and contrast of at what we term folklore versus facts. And we want to examine prophets as they appear in the Bible versus as they should appear and contrast how they appear versus how they do appear in the Quran and in Islam. Again, we want to show the contrast between the way prophets are viewed and looked at in Islam and in the Quran versus how prophets are viewed in the Bible and in Christianity. And when you look at these two contrasts between the Quran and Islam's view of the prophets and the Bible's and Christianity's view of the prophets, it will become clear to you truth from falsehood. Let us look at some points that when we think about prophets and messengers of God, we think about people who have the highest status amongst us and should be the best amongst us and should be the examples amongst us. The first point is that prophets are holy elect and true servants of God. Prophets are holy elect and true servants of God. And we find this support in the Bible in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 19 to 20. We find, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens, fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So here it talks about the prophets in the way that they are and here it talks about the prophets 
in the way that they are the foundation and that they are holy saints and they are with God not that they are despicable people and despise people with vile and corrupt character but rather they are amongst an elevated and honored group and also we find this mentioned even more clearly in the book of Acts in the book of Acts chapter 3 verse 21 it says whom the heaven must receive unto the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of of all his holy prophets since the world began. I was very interested in this word holy used in this verse that I went and looked it up in the Bible concordance and I found something very shocking. This verse in the New Testament is used 163 times. This word holy, the description of the prophets is used 163 times and it's never used in any other way meaning to be one unblemished and holy and pure in the sight of God it's actually the same word used for the Holy Spirit it's actually the same word used to describe when Jesus is called holy this is the same word used to describe the prophets who were sent to the world from the beginning of time so according to this description then we know that prophets should be holy and they should be people who are upright and well behaved and servants of the true God. Contrast this to what we see among some of the prophets mentioned in the Bible as we're going to come to. So keep this first point in mind. The second point is that prophets are role models and doers of righteousness. Prophets are role models and doers of righteousness. We find described in the book of John, chapter 3, verses 20 to 21, describing the character of prophets. And it says, according to the, to the tongue, according, this is put on the tongue of Jesus, for everyone that does evil hates the light. Neither comes to the light, lest his deed should be reproved and exposed. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. So people of evil, they are afraid to be in the limelight, because their deeds will be exposed. But those who are doers are good, that they come to the front and have no problem with their deeds being manifest because they are wrought in God. All the prophets and messengers were on the forefront. God raised them up in front of the people to be people of excellence and nobility and honor. How then can such a man that God raised up be behaving in a way worse than all of those he's calling to the way of God? This does not make any sense. And this we have to accept. This does not make any sense. And this we have to reject. And we cannot accept such a standard and principle as relates to the prophets. The third point I want to mention is prophets are those who warn against sin and disobedience. Prophets are those who warn against sin and disobedience. And again, as we mentioned, we've shown in Acts 3.21, it states, Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So the prophets are not people other than those who are holy before God. And what does it mean to be holy before God? To be holy before God means that there are people who are following the commands of God. There are people who are obeying God. There are people who are under the commands and law of God and fulfilling them in every way possible. For all those who oppose God 
and reject God, then never could they be considered to be holy. But we know the prophets are holy because they fulfill his function of being in the conformity and the fulfillment of the commands and laws of God. Also, we find in Genesis chapter 6, verse 22, where God defines this even more clear. It states, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. And we follow the next verse. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house unto the ark. For you have I seen righteousness before me in this generation. So because Noah was following the commands of God, then God said about Noah, because of that, he has seen righteousness in him before God because of his following all the commands that God has gave him. So God is tying, fulfilling the commandments with righteousness before him as we see an example of Noah and this is clear. And remember all these points because we want to show a contrast even to Noah himself of how they are depicted elsewhere in the Bible and by Christians the idea that even prophets are given to some of the worst crimes and sins that we could think of. We find quite the opposite here where God calls Noah righteous before God. Why? Because he, he did everything that God commanded him to do. The last point we want to mention here is prophets are callers to the oneness and sovereignty of God alone. One of the most important and essential qualities of prophets is that they call to the oneness, the complete oneness, the absolute oneness, the everlasting infinite oneness, the indivisible oneness of God Almighty, and they call to the fulfillment of following the prophets and messengers. And we will read in this regards again, as we find in the Bible, Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 20. And it reads, And they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall you be established. Believe in his prophets. So shall you prosper. So the prophets is calling to believe in God alone. And also to believe in the prophets whom God has sent that they may prosper and that they may have success and be established before God. Contrast this to what we hear about prophets and the despicable things that said about them and that's written about them. And this is why I said we call this section Folklore versus Facts. We heard the facts. We heard the principles given about how prophets are supposed to be and how they should be. But now, let us look at some descriptions that's given of our prophets that we can never accept. Let's view these descriptions in closing, and then let us make the contrast between how prophets are honored and exalted and established to be the best of humanity as taught in Islam, and how prophets and messengers are seen in such a disparaging way in a defiled way according to the Bible and Christian teachings. According to the Bible and according to Christians who advocate such, prophets are seen as profligate and indecent. So it says in 2 Samuel chapter 11 verses 2 to 4, it reads, And it came to pass in the evening that David arose from his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, bathing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, Is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Elaine or Eliam, the wife of Uriah 
the Hittite. And David sent messengers and took her. And she came into she came in unto him, and he laid with her, for she was purified from uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. So here the Bible is depicting David as seeing a woman from the rooftop as she was bathing and couldn't control himself so he sent for her and became intimate with her and we would have to suppose that this was against her will as she was married and this was well known and after he was intimate with her she cleans herself and then went back to her house is this the quality and characteristic of a prophet is this the demeanor and behavior of a prophet we think not for this is what is promoted against prophets and we seek God's protection from such prophets are idol worshippers according to what's reported in the Bible and promoted by Christians. Prophets are idol worshippers. So we find in the Bible prophets indulging in idol worship, worshipping of idols, others or things besides God Almighty. We find in 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 4 to 6 it reads, For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father for Solomon went after Ashtoreth the goddess of Zidonians and after Milcom the abomination of the Ammonites and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and went not fully after the Lord as did David his father then did Solomon build in high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, in the hill that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the children of Ammon. And likewise he did, and likewise did he for all his strange wives, which burnt incense and sacrifice unto their gods. And the Lord was angry with Solomon. Because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. So, here we see that according to the Bible, and according to the propaganda of Christians, Solomon turned to idol worship, a prophet of God, coming to proclaim the word of God. One who God had spoken to and revealed himself to, more than once, as it states, could turn and worship idols, we seek protection of God from that. This is not something as Muslims that we ascribe and accept as being true against the prophets. Prophets are murderers. According to 2 Samuel 11, verses 14 to 17, we read, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in a letter saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hardest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. And it came to pass when Joab observed the city that he assigned Uriah unto a place where he knew that valiant men were. And the men of the city went out and fought with Joab and there fell some of the people of the servants of David. And Uriah the Hittite died also. So here, according to the Bible, David sent a man into battle and he was told to put this man on the front line in the fiercest battle and to back up off him, to almost leave him there, to be assured that he would get killed. And why is this the case, according to the Bible? Because earlier we read that the same man was the one who David slept with his wife. The same man was the one who David seen his wife while she was bathing from a rooftop and desired her and called for her and had sex with her and then to hide and cover up this affair and the consequence of it, David, because the woman became pregnant, because David sent this man into battle to get killed. Such a despicable story that we find attributed to a great prophet the messenger of God. And what's even more interesting is that as Christians promote such blasphemy against the prophets of God, at the same time they claim the rank of David. They claim the rank of David that Jesus is the descendant 
of David, who is to come as the Messiah in the line of David and to sit on the throne of David. Yet they have no problem with David being a murderer and being a profligate man who is after women, seducing them, and then sending their husbands into battle to die to hide up and cover up for the consequence of their relationships. Yet this is the father, the grandfather of their Lord. Are we going to accept this? Can we accept this to be attributed truthfully to a true prophet and messenger of God? Or is this just folklore? Prophets are womanizers. Prophets are womanizers according to the Bible. And we find this mention in 1 Kings chapter 11 verses 1 to 3. But King Solomon loved many strange women together with the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites. Of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go into them, neither shall they come in unto you. For surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. So according to the Bible, Solomon had seven hundred wives and princesses, and three hundred concubines. This is what it says about Solomon, the great prophet of God. And finally, before we make our closing conclusions, is in the Bible, it states that prophets are drunkards. It states that prophets and messengers are drunkards. In Genesis chapter 9 verses 20 and 21, it says, And Noah began to be a husbandman, a farmer, a tiller, and he planned a vineyard, and he drank of the wine, and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. He became so drunk that he stripped himself naked. And it goes on to describe some other things. But according to this, the prophet, who was supposed to know how to till the land, then realized to drink from this vine would make him drunk. And he became so drunk that he became naked. Here is a man calling people to salvation, and he's getting, as we call it, stoned or pissed drunk. Can we accept this as being true about the prophets and messengers of God? Is this a characteristic that we would consider to be one befitting of that of God? When we look in the Quran, one verse sums up for us beautifully how God has elevated these prophets and honored them and that never could such behavior be befitting for them in the least. In the sixth chapter of the Quran, verses 83 to 90, it says, Ibrahim ala نَرْفَعُ دَرَجَاتٍ مَنْ نَشَاءٍ إِنَّ رَبَّكَ حَكِيمٌ عَلِيمٌ وَوَهَبْنَا لَهُ إِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ كُلًّا هَدَيْنَا وَنُوحًا هَدَيْنَا مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّتِهِ دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ وَأَيُّوبَ وَيُوسُفَ وَمُوسَى وَهَارُونَ وَكَذَلِكَ نَجْزِي الْمُحْسِنِينَ وَزَكَرِيَّا وَيَحْيَى وَعِيسَى وَإِلْيَاسِ كُلٌّ مِّنَ الصَّالِحِينَ وإسماعيل واليسع ويونس ولوطا وكلا فضلنا على العالمين 
وَمِنْ آبَائِهِمْ وَذُرِّيَّاتِهِمْ وَإِخْوَانِهِمْ وَاجْتَبَيْنَاهُمْ وَهَدَيْنَاهُمْ إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ ذَلِكَ هُدَى اللَّهِ يَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ وَلَوْ أَشْرَكُوا لَحَبِطَ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ آتَيْنَاهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةَ فَإِنْ يَكْفُرْ بِهَا هَؤُلَاءِ فَقَدْ وَكَّلْنَا بِهَا قَوْمًا لَيْسُوا بِهَا بِكَافِرِينَ أُولَئِكَ الَّذِينَ هَدَى اللَّهِ فَبِهُدَاهُ مُقْتَدِهِ قل لا أسألكم عليه أجرا إن هو إلا ذكرى للعالمين. Such a beautiful description I got in these verses tells us about the prophets and messengers and how he has preferred them and raised them and guided them and taught them to be amongst the righteous and excellent. We don't hear from amongst them the blasphemy that we hear coming out the Bible and coming from the Christians on how these prophets who are supposed to guide humanity yet are indulging in some of the worst acts that you can find amongst humanity. This is the difference between how Islam sees the prophets and how Christianity sees the prophets. The prophets, according to Islam, are ones who are upright and obedient to God and diligent to God and doesn't sin before God because sin, as defined in Islam, is willful disobedience to the commands of God. We don't believe that prophets involve themselves in willful disobedience to the commands of God. They may make human mistakes. They may have make human error in judgment. But yet, they are not prone or susceptible to being in willful disobedience to God. But according to the Christians and the Bible, you find the opposite. You find in their folklore of their descriptions of prophets, how they attribute and describe the prophets such heinous and blasphemous actions that no one would accept at all, yet they pin this upon the best of creations, the ones, the very ones that God has raised up, that God has elected to guide people back to his way. Such a contradiction in theology, such a contradiction in philosophy, such a contradiction in practicality, such a contradiction in every way possible that you can think of, that God would elect and raise up these people for humanity only to have them be depraved and disobedient and defiant to the laws of God and acting in a way that's inappropriate and accept unacceptable according to what God would expect from us. View it, view the distinction between the two and come to a clear judgment, a clear conclusion that indeed the picture of Islam of the prophets, the picture of Islam, of the prophets and messengers, on how they interact with humanity and with God, and how we are to interact with them, and believe in them, and to support them, and to follow them, is much more conducive, and congruous, and along the lines of the divine intent of why God raised up prophets and messengers, in contrast to the low and blasphemous and degrading image that the Christians promote against prophets who are supposed to be the best of humanity only to try to draw the case and bolster the case of having one individual in particular be the one that's without fault or without sin. 
Um, this, again, we term folklore. We reject it. And the proof has been presented before you. We hope you make the wise choice in accepting it. Hada wa sallallahu ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. Subhanaka lahum wa bihamdika. Ashadu la ilal ans. Asakhluka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.